Hello everyone and welcome to the Adobe Education Summit 2021. My name is Camilo Montenegro and I'll be talking to you about designing for empowerment. Um, I'll be sharing some hopefully useful tips and suggestions for how we can embed empowerment by design into our curriculum, our learning objectives, our lesson plans, and hopefully also sharing some useful resources that you might uh, be able to use later on and um, throughout your career. So um, let's get started. So um, again, welcome everyone and, and uh, thank you for thank you for being here. Um, it's it's a great um, it's a great honor to be participating in this event. A lot of effort and a lot of work has gone into putting it together for all of all of us, all of us teachers who are eager to learn um, a little bit more about creativity and how we can um, um, integrate it into our classrooms. So, um, just sort of quickly, one of the things um, that I'd like to start with is the uh, overview. We'll be starting by discussing what creativity is and isn't. Of course, you've already heard throughout the event um, different people referring to creativity and offering definitions of it and their own thoughts on it. Um, I'll, I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about what creativity is and what it isn't, only because it's important to have these distinctions um, clear in our minds when we're thinking about designing um, curriculum or, or learning objectives, lesson plans, and, and all of that. Um, and then, of course, we'll be talking about how empowerment and creativity are linked. Um, it'll be really important to sort of put that up the forefront and just sort of realize um, how each feeds back into the other. And that's something that we'll be talking about um, throughout the uh, throughout the session. Then also, um, I'll, I'll share with you some thoughts on why using design methodologies can help us embed empowerment within our curricula and our our planning. Um, oftentimes, we think of design as something that's done for um, products that we consume or um, for. Um, art or that sort of interesting uh, blend of the bo of, of both of those but really we can use the same design methodologies when we're talking about education and when we're talking about learning and teaching and then of course at the center of it all um, we'll be focusing on why it is that we're doing what we're doing who it is that's at the center of all of our efforts um, and that of course is our students so more specifically, the session goals um, for this next hour will be starting off, of course, by discussing what creativity and empowerment are. Then we'll move on to thinking about how um, developing your own sense of creativity is essential in helping your students do the same thing. It's important to remember and to keep in mind that if we are not um, fully confident and fully um, aware um, of our own sense of creative worth, it will be very difficult to be able to transmit that to our students. So before we do anything else, we have to, we have to um, accept ourselves as creative beings. Then we'll be looking at um, uh, Adobe's framework for the creative process. Adobe has done a great job of distilling different design methodologies and really creating a, uh, a very friendly, um, user-friendly uh, version um, that is very accessible for teachers and students. Then we'll move on to how creativity in the classroom can lead to empowerment beyond the classroom, which if we think about it is really our objective, right? So as much as we care about um, the students in our classroom and as much as we care about um, our classes themselves, really if if we really think about it, what we're trying to do is empower our students to do things beyond us, beyond our classrooms, beyond our schools. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. Then we, um, I'll share a couple of tools and some examples that I've, um, of, of tools that I've used in my classes so that perhaps it'll help maybe 
um, help you um, brainstorm a couple of ideas or, or inspire you to uh, maybe try some of these uh, tools and maybe some of these uh, lesson ideas and project ideas into your own classes. Then we'll be defining creativity and empowerment, right? So at the very beginning, we started by discussing it, but then of course we want to be able to define it and um, have our own internalized definition of what these two things are. And then we will conclude um, from where we started, sort of, which is really thinking about our own sense of creative worth, which again is super important for us to have in order to instill it in our students. So um, let's get started. And one of the, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, not out of vanity or anything like that, but simply to give you a little context of where it is that I'm coming from and why I'll be mentioning a few things towards the end of this, um, this session. So I've, I've always um, felt, or rather, I've always been somewhat creative, right? So even from a very early age, um, I, I enjoyed painting. Um, I enjoyed sounds very much. Um, not necessarily making music, but I was, I was really into listening to how sounds worked in recordings, um, in movies, um, and that sort of thing. And I was always sort of kind of like playing with um, multimedia um, type approaches. Of course, I was very young. We're talking, you know, elementary um, age here. Um, so I wasn't able to articulate anything. I, I wasn't consciously deliberate or aware of my creativity, um, not myself at least. I was very fortunate, however, to have had a, a teacher, I believe either in, in kinder or perhaps in first or second grade, um, that seemed to believe that I had some sort of artistic talent. And this wonderful teacher, whose name I unfortunately cannot remember, um, actually went out of her way to um, come to my house and visit my parents and, and tell them this. And um, you can imagine, of course, that I don't have, I don't, I don't remember very many things from when I was in kinder or first grade, uh, but I do remember that. That definitely left a very lasting impression. So um, I was very fortunate to have had that teacher in my life. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I, I continued um, exploring my sense of creativity as I got a little bit older. I became a little bit more deliberate about it, especially with music and with painting, I guess, but mostly music. And then fast forward um, to my adult life and together with um, two very close friends and also teachers, um, we ended up making, uh, creating a band and writing songs and recording songs and playing them live and, and just, you know, doing this whole, this whole thing that we had always wanted to do with, with original music. And at the same time, I also started to really further my interest in digital art um, using Adobe tools, actually, um, that were very significant in my, in my development of my own sense of creative worth. And interestingly, all of this creativity was inspired and, and really came to the forefront um, as a result of my starting to work as a teacher, right? So before working as a teacher, I, I knew that I was interested in music and art and I had this, this great, great passion, but I sort of kept it to myself. Um, and I, I wasn't really ready to sort of just bring everything together and just um, accept that um, all of these different interests and uh, creative pursuits that I had could actually come together. And the best place for them to come together, of course, ended up being the classroom. So it's interesting to think back on, on how these, um, these creative pursuits really came to the forefront as a result of my, of my teaching. Um, of course, we've all probably had experiences like that. So it would be really great to hear a little bit about um, who you are and what your experiences with creativity have been, your interests, your, your, your creative pursuits throughout your life. Um, remember, it doesn't necessarily have to be something artistic. It doesn't have to be painting or music or anything like that. Uh, but depending on what you think creativity is, I would love to hear um, what, you, um, what your creative 
um, pursuits have been throughout your life. So please um, go ahead and share that through Twitter. On the upper left-hand corner, you'll see my Twitter handle, at Before Code, and on the top right-hand corner, you'll see the hashtag for Adobe EDU Creative. So please go ahead and tweet that out. And of course, as you've you've heard throughout the uh, throughout the day, throughout the first sessions, we can't have a uh, we can't talk about creativity um, without talking about the late Sir Ken Robinson, who was of course a brilliant man, um, a phenomenal speaker. Um, and if if you've if you've seen his videos, if of his talks. You'll also uh, probably agree that he, he had a bit of a stand-up comic side to him. He was, he was hilarious when he, when he gave his talks. Um, he managed to be very insightful, um, very precise, and at the same time, just hilariously funny. And it would be great um, if you could just take a couple of minutes and sort of think about the quote that's over here on the left-hand side of, of the slide and um, just sort of interiorize it. And then I would love for you to share through Twitter what you sort of think um, he's um, trying to, what he's getting at, how you would paraphrase or how you would interpret um, what, he's, what he's mentioning. Of course, there's a couple of uh, key um, items, I think, in that quote. One of them for me is the word medium, um, people finding their medium. And then, of course, that last sentence, helping people to connect their personal creative capacities is the surest way to release the best they have to offer. So please um, go ahead, tweet that out, um, your thoughts on that uh, and your reflection on that, uh, on that quote. If you haven't yet read his book, Out of Our Minds, you really, really should. Every educator should read that book. You will not be disappointed. So when we talk about creativity, of course, um, as, as I've sort of been alluding to um, so far, we're, we're talking about a lot of different um, interpretations. And I would, I would really like to hear and, and see rather what your interpretations of this word are. So again, if you could go ahead and uh, tweet that out, that'd be fantastic, share it with everyone, and we can, we can discuss it and, and reflect on it. Um, creativity is of course, in my interpretation of it, um, something that is um, quite complex. And when you think about all the different um, interpretations that there are for, for what creativity might be, it's important to remember that there's, there's a great deal of mystery, scientific mystery around it, right? So um, as, as far as we've come in the field of neuroscience and psychology and other related fields, we currently do not understand, we currently do not actually know what creativity is in a scientific sense in a biological sense, in a chemical sense. We don't really know um, how the brain or how the body produces what we call, what we interpret as creativity. Um, the only thing that we can be fairly certain of is that it is an inherently and intrinsic um, human characteristic. And the other thing that I would suggest, of course, and I think you would probably agree, especially when you compare and contrast all of the different definitions of creativity that you might hear, is that creativity is not one single thing or one single event. Creativity involves various different elements coming together um, in different ways at different moments. So really when we're talking about creativity, we're talking about a process a really complex process that we'll be um, looking into with a little bit more detail. And um, I'd like to start off with um, Mitchell Resnick, who um, his name might not um, sound, uh, might not ring any bells, but I'm sure you know his work because I'm sure you've all heard of um, Scratch. If you've ever heard of Scratch, the, the, the programming language, then you've heard of Mitchell Resnick. Um, he was one of the creators of, of, of Scratch. He's the, the head of the MIT Media Lab that produces um, Scratch. And um, I, I, I want to share 
um, some um, this little uh, a clip of his of, of this video um, because he alludes to something that I think we've all heard a million times, but I think it took on um, a different sort of uh, hue. It it it, it brought it, it had uh, more importance suddenly um, in 2020. So let's let's listen to the first uh, three minutes of of this interview with with uh, Mitchell Resnick. I think there's one thing that everyone can agree on, and that's that we're living in a world that's changing more rapidly than ever before. Things that we learn today might be obsolete tomorrow. We all recognize the world is changing incredibly quickly. So because of that, learning particular you know, you know, facts or skills today might not be useful in the future. The thing that is most important in a rapidly changing world is the ability to think and act creatively. Because no matter what situation you're in, we know that you'll be confronted by new and unexpected problems in the future. So we don't know exactly what those problems will be or what those unexpected situations will be. But if we help people develop as creative thinkers, they'll be well prepared for a world that's constantly changing. Now, unfortunately, uh, the education system today is not set up to help prepare people to develop as creative thinkers. Uh, the education system was set up for a time where people learned what they needed to learn you know, from age 6 to 18, and then they used that knowledge the rest of their life. We need to shift around our priorities in education so that we put a higher priority in preparing young people to think and act creatively so they can come up with innovative solutions to the, cre to the unexpected situations that we know will await them. So as I've thought about how is it that we can prepare people to become creative thinkers, I've looked around and I've gotten a lot of my inspiration from the way children learn in kindergarten. But so I think kindergarten gets people off to a, right, to, to a good start as creative thinkers. If you think about the traditional kindergarten, kids spend a lot of time in kindergarten you know, playfully creating things in collaboration with one another. They build towers out of blocks. They you know, build pictures. They create pictures with finger paints and crayons. In the process, they learn a lot. When they build with blocks, they learn about stability, what makes things stand up or fall down. Uh, when they make pictures with crayons and finger paints, they learn how colors mix together. But maybe even more important, they learn about the creative process. They learn about how to start with an idea, explore the idea, and follow it through, uh, and continue to develop a project based on a creative idea. So I think kindergartens, at least traditional kindergartens, have helped children start to develop as creative thinkers. But then after kindergarten, Kids get into the rest of the school system where they sit there, they fill out worksheets, they listen to lectures, and it takes away their development as creative thinkers. Unfortunately, in many places, kindergartens are becoming more like the rest of school. You go into kindergartens today, and in many places, kids are filling out mathematics worksheets and you know, exercises and doing phonics drills. And they aren't doing the type of playful, collaborative, creative activities that they've done in the past. So kindergarten is becoming more like the rest of school. What I'm arguing for is that we need to make the rest of school, in fact, the rest of life, more like kindergarten. So to sort of build on, on what you just heard from, from Mitchell Resnick, when he alludes to this idea of creative thinkers um, being able to take on um, the challenges of an, of an uncertain and, and constantly changing world. I think we can all agree that 2020 um, reminded us all just how severely, um, how quickly things can change from one day to another, right? So we've all experienced the pandemic. And just think about how many different aspects of our lives and of society all over the world, almost simultaneously changed radically from one minute to the next. And think about how quickly people needed to adapt. Everything from how restaurants had to suddenly 
uh, completely rethink their 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 business model and their approach to be able to survive um, going from um, indoor uh, dining um, or in-person dining to suddenly developing um, successful takeout um, um, businesses um, or, or ourselves in the education field. Just think about how incredibly difficult and, um, and urgent we needed, urgently we needed to find a completely uh, different way of being able to teach our students remotely and on and on we can we can we can list an almost an endless um, um, array of, of social um, uh, changes that came as a result of the pandemic um, and then if you think about climate change which is something else that is um, uh, uh, one of those things that is looming large in our in our present and increasingly so in our future we can all probably agree that we're going to need very, very creative solutions to resolve these critical issues that we see coming up in, in, in the future of, of humankind. Um, and to that, to that effect, um, I'd, I'd like to just sort of also um, specify or clarify two different areas. So, so when we talk about an ever-changing world, oftentimes we sort of put it within the context of technology. The technology is increasing, uh, is, is evolving at an exponential rate, and that obsolescence comes faster and faster, and that we need to adapt to new technologies. And, and that might be true, but I think the, the technological aspect of it is actually perhaps the least critical. Rather, what we really need to um, instill in our students is the creative adaptability to the world as a complex system so that when there is a change in, in one part of, of, the, of this complex system that we call the world and society, they are quickly able to pivot and adapt and survive, thrive, be successful, be happy. Um, the technological side of it, we, we all sort of um, learn sort of intuitively. Like it just, it's, it, I mean, if you think about it, nobody, Nobody taught you really how to live in a world in, in, in like in, in my generation at least, where video games, um, cable television, um, eventually cell phones, etc., um, came into being. We just sort of adopted these tools, and, and it felt just sort of very natural. Um, we didn't have to go to a class where we had to learn how to live with these devices. Um, we definitely, though would have benefited, at least I know I would have benefited from classes that would have taught me how to approach life creatively, meaning that if I would have gone to a, a computer class, a computers class that showed me how to solve problems rather than just sort of play games or just uh, follow a list of instructions, um, like with Logo, um, then perhaps um, I, would have, I would have benefited a lot more from those classes than I actually did. And the other thing I'd like to sort of mention is that these unpredictable moments that will be coming up increasingly in for in our world and and for us as as a species these these problems aren't going to have solutions unless we have creative thinkers um, ready to tackle them that's it's just that simple we're going to need people to be at their creative best to do it and now is when we need to start working towards that so um if we, uh, if we consider all of that um, and, and we think about what creativity is in, in, in detail, I think we can sort of um, break it down into three different things, um, sort of paraphrasing Ken Robinson. And one of them, the first one that I'd like to point out is that oftentimes creativity is sort of confused with imagination, when in fact they're both two very different things. So imagination is subjective and it's limitless and structureless, right? So we can imagine all sorts of things at any moment of the day, um, anywhere that we might be, and there's no rules for it. There's no right and wrong for imagination. You're, you're free to imagine anything that you want. But imagination by itself isn't going to necessarily produce anything. And that's where creativity comes in. Creativity is a step further. It, it needs to rely on imagination, definitely. But creativity requires work. It requires instruction. It requires commitment. It requires um, going through the different phases of the process. 
so that at the end of it, you actually have something that exists in the world and that can be iterated upon, that can be improved upon, that can be useful to someone else. Um, creativity to actually um, result in that um, tangible product in the world requires critical judgments um, in terms of its worth and its value. And that can mean um, different things in different contexts. But there's always going to be a moment where you have to be able to reflect upon what it is that you're creating to be able to evaluate whether or not you should continue on the path that you're on or whether or not you should explore different possibilities, change paths completely, or perhaps just scratch the idea entirely. This is true in music. It's true in engineering. It's true in mathematics. It's true in physics. It's true in writing, anything, any creative endeavor. Um, is going to require being able to reflect on what it is that you're creating and being able to make critical judgments that'll inform the decisions that you make throughout the creative process. And then, of course, creative achievement requires tools and mediums. Um, if you're working towards something, um, if you're working towards producing something, you're going to need the proper tools and the mediums to do it. And this is where uh, Ken Robinson also points out that it's critically important that we allow our students to sort of um, be exposed to different tools and different mediums in order for them to be able to decide which ones are the ones that they feel most comfortable with. Um, some students might feel um, at home in the medium um, of engineering, um, being able to design um, different um, mechanical or or um, other solutions for things, whereas other students might feel more comfortable in the medium of writing. And perhaps um, for them, um, writing a novel is the sort of medium where they can develop their, their creativity um, to its fullest. That's why it's critically important that at an early age they're exposed to different mediums and different tools so that they can find their own way um, through them, perhaps even combining them um, in ways that we would not normally have thought of. So um, those are sort of the three um, specific um, sort of um, details of creativity um, that might be very useful for us to keep in mind when we are working with, with our students. And to sort of um, end this, uh, this first section on creativity, um, I'm, I'm going to again rely on Ken Robinson and his definition of it, which you've already um, heard a few people mention before. So creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value. Um, now, let me just point out real quick that Ken Robinson did not mean, and I certainly do not interpret his, his, um, his quote, his, his writing to mean, that value is necessarily a, a monetary value. That's not what Ken Robinson was alluding to. He's not alluding to a market. He's not alluding to if your idea isn't um, capable of being sold to someone for money, then it's, it's, it's no good. That's not what he, was, what he was getting at. By value, it means that someone can use it productively um, for something that it is interesting to someone for some reason. That could be a poem, that could be a song, um, that could be a new invention, that could be a mathematical formula, um, any number of things. Um, so, so value, not monetary value, but rather just um, the, 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 the value that somebody might find in it for their own reason. Um, and then, of course, we have the two other critical words in that phrase, which is process and original. And so I sort of tried to um, create a, a visual graphic for, for what that means to me. And um, when, when I approach my students with, with a creative task, um, I usually try to have them focus on three different things. One is that it's something that they are going to be personally interested in, something that they actually have that interest in. Second is that it's going to be original. Um, again, not necessarily original in the sense that it has never existed in any way, shape or form before they thought of it, but rather original that it's at least something that is novel, something that is new to them at the very least. Um, and at best, of course, um, new or novel, um, to a greater number of people. That, that is, of course, fantastic when, when that happens. Um, and then 
uh, viable is, is the third thing I ask them to keep in mind. And by viable, I mean um, two separate things. One is that they're able to produce it with the resources that they have at hand, but also viable in the sense that there is going to be someone or a group of people that will be interested in this creative product that will result at the end of the process. Now, how do you work through the creative process? And um, as I said at the beginning, there are lots of different methodologies for doing this. And Adobe has done a great job of sort of distilling and sifting through all of them and putting together a framework that is um, very useful and very um, user friendly for teachers and students. Um, there's three different parts. In, in this session, we're focusing on the first one, which is the define stage of, of the creative process, where you think about the, the who and the what and the why. Uh, and then the other two parts are, of course, the create um, part of the process and then the reflect part of the process, where you, you re alluding again to the uh, making the critical judgments, um, yourself, but also getting feedback from, from others. So it's really important to have um, this framework um, at, at hand because it will make our, our lives and our, and our creative endeavors with our students much easier. Um, and, um, and with that in mind, I'd like to move on to sort of um, a, a, a second part of this, of this um, equation um, that we're trying to uh, master. Um, and that's the design process itself. And as I said a little bit earlier um, at the beginning of this session, um, design methodologies should not be used only for the things that we might expect, like you know, designing a, a new a toothbrush or a chair or a car or or any other um, 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 commodity or product, we can successfully and appropriately use them in education for um, teaching and learning. And um, I'd like to focus on um, one methodology um, specifically, which is design thinking. And um, David Kelly is is one of the uh, one of the founders or one of the creators or articulators of this of this um, approach. And um, at the center of it is the firm belief that it's all about the person or the people that you are designing for, and it is not about you, the designer. And sometimes um, in education, that, that sort of, um, it, it can be troubling for some teachers because it means that you have to sort of let go of control and you have to let go of your own, the pressure that you might have um, from, from, from your principal, from your district, from, from whomever, to produce certain results. And instead of um, fixating sort of on that, you have to sort of focus on your students and, and find some way of designing exclusively with them in mind. So if, uh, if, you, if you can take a few moments and just uh, look at the uh, uh, the, the quote that's on the left, um, you'll notice, of course, that there's a couple of, a couple of words that'll probably catch your attention immediately. Um, one of them, of course, being um, empathy, the other one perhaps being human-centeredness. So please, if, if you could go ahead and read what's on uh, the left side of this slide here in that quote, and then go ahead and uh, tweet um, tagging me um, at before code and using the hashtag Adobe EDU creative. Um, it'll be great if you could share your thoughts on this quote. And with um, design thinking in mind, um, this little, um, this activity is, is, is interesting, right? So we have two, two chairs. Um, one of them, or rather both of them, were clearly designed with different um, objectives in mind and probably designed for different, um, entirely different groups of people in mind, even though they're meant to be used in the same place, which is obviously a classroom. So, and I did this, with, I, I did this activity with my students. I asked them to um, think about um, who, so the chair on the left, I asked them, who was that chair designed for? And I asked them to explain why they thought that. 
And then I asked them to compare it to the chair on the right. And I asked them, who was that chair designed for? And I asked them to justify why they thought that. And interestingly, it came up that the chair on the left, they realized is one, very uncomfortable, obviously, right? Because, and, they've, and the interesting thing is that they'd actually, they actually have both of these kinds of chairs in, in their school. Um, the chair on the left is obviously very um, uncomfortable. Um, it's also, it doesn't give them any flexibility to move. Um, when you're in that chair, you're expected to stay in the same place. Um, so it's not, very, it's not very friendly to the end user. Um, whereas on the right, of course, it's a lot more comfortable. Um, there's obviously more thought uh, for, for what the student would need, you know, a little, a little um, space on the bottom to put thing, their, their belongings in, um, a little uh, f flexible, movable table that they can move um, out of the way whenever they don't need it or they can bring in closer when they do need it, um, um, armrests, et cetera, a, a more ergonomic design, et cetera. And so they realized very quickly that the chair on the left is probably designed for teachers and probably for a more traditional classroom setting where the students aren't expected to be moving, talking, um, or really having any independence at all. Whereas the chair on the right is designed for the student to be comfortable and to be slightly more empowered um, and more independent when they're in their classroom. So. Um, this is, is just as an example to keep in mind this, this question whenever we're working on curriculum design or, or lesson planning or, or anything else, um, who are we designing for? And just sort of remember that it's not about us, it's about them. We are designing for them. And um, in, in that sense, Yong Zhao very um, eloquently expresses it in this video. He says, he says something critical that we, that we should probably all um, keep in mind. So I'll, I'll play this video for you and I think it'll be sort of self-explanatory. Um, the, the first thing we can think about is uh, when schools are closed, we might be rethink about the what of teaching. Let's take a look at um, the what of teaching. We've been debating that for a long time. And uh, every few years, we have new reports coming out to tell us we should be teaching this and teaching that and teaching that. Schools have been asked to teach a lot. But uh, most of this, a lot, had nothing to do with children. They are really the design or thinking of adults and quite old adults, honestly, to be able to have a voice in deciding what schools should do. And so what I want to change that is okay, what do we really need to teach? Can we start from children, not starting from the curriculum? And this is the moment to do that. You know, when children are at home, when children are spending time with their parents, and uh, it is a great moment to ask our children to say, what would you like to learn? And what would you want to learn more? What don't you want to learn? I think that's the biggest thing we can start with about personalization. Personalization has been used and adopted by schools in many different ways. Uh, mostly has to do with the process. So the personalization has to do with the, you know, when do you want to learn, how you want to develop that, and even with the curriculum, uh, we, we take the curriculum, we personalize the curriculum, we try to make it okay, you can learn this faster, you can learn this slower, but seldom have we really talked about what do children want to learn. And we know that children are, are very different. They are, they are different from each other. And there are some common things, you know, people would call it the basics, that our children need to develop the same ideas, the basic things. But those are very basic. Beyond that, I think every child deserves the opportunity to capitalize on his or her strength his or her interests and passions, 
and to become uniquely great in their own way. There's a lot of you know, research supporting that. In the new age, we call it the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution, or some people call it the, the second machine age, which is the computers uh, uh, beyond what we had in the industrial revolution. We need people who will be different from machines. And this um, Tim Cook of Apple has been talking about, he's not afraid of um, machines more and more like human beings. He's more afraid of human beings becoming more and more mechanic, more and more like machines. And our traditional education, in a way of trying to teach a subject, teach the curriculum, is in essence trying to make our children the same. So my approach would say, let's re-examine, let's ask our children what they would like to learn. Let's co-create, co-create a curriculum that's emergent based on our children's learning and interest and, and expand that. So that's the first thing I think we can rethink. I do encourage many schools to rethink. And uh, even if a school cannot rethink all the time, we can think about some of the time. Maybe 20% of the time children can devote to their own learning, 30% or 40%. So that's what I want to invite us to think and say what we can do. And so, of course, if, if we listen to um, what Yong Zhao said um, and we think about it, um, at the core of it is empathy. Um, because if we are asking our students what they are interested in, what they want to learn, then we are being empathetic. We, as, as also as he alluded to, we all have um, requirements and we all have uh, things that we absolutely need to do um, and that we can't really negotiate them, right? So, so obviously one of the things is like, well, yeah, I'd like to ask them what they want to learn and I'd love to you know, make a, a tailor-made, um, customized uh, curriculum for them, but that that's just not feasible. It's not it's not possible. Completely, uh, completely agree. I completely agree with that. Um, so I've, I've 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 broken it down, sort of like the way that we could approach um, the beginning of this, um, sort of building on what on, on what Young Zhao said, which is, of course, you can't you know change a hundred percent of everything right now, and definitely not from one day to the next. But maybe you can you can provide ten percent, fifteen percent, forty percent of the time to your students for having these sort of self-directed moments. And so I've, I've sort of visualized that as a sort of uh, a traffic light, right? So if we think about the areas in which we can right now start designing um, completely from an empathetic point of view with sort of like this design thinking process in mind, thinking about our students and what their interests are, then perhaps we can make some immediate changes. and offer some immediate possibilities for that. So that's sort of like the green light. Then the next um, sort of area would be the places where we could maybe do it if we have the right authorization or the right support or the right buy-in from, from different stakeholders. Um, but it'll, it'll, it, it might take a little bit more time. It won't be so immediate. And then of course, there's the, there's the red light, right? The, the things that we can't change at all because it's not in our hands to change them, right? We can't change our district guidelines. We can't change our government uh, mandates, but um, but that's something that somebody else will, will will perhaps be able to help us with eventually. We can work towards it. The more teachers begin to demand this shift, the more likely that shift will occur at the at the at the top level of, of administration and of government. But right now I'm sure that we can all think of, of areas where we can inject this sort of design thinking, this this empathetic human centered approach to our curriculum design or lesson plans or our or, or, or learning objectives. And when we when we think about empathy I also want to go beyond a little bit the uh, a, a, beyond the academic realm, in the sense that um, our students are, of course, young human beings, and as young human beings, they're vulnerable and they're fragile, and they have all of the different emotions that we have, except that because of their age, 
things are more difficult for them to be able to handle and process at times. So that means that they need more support, not less support than perhaps what we need. And if we're honest with ourselves as adults, we need a lot of support a lot of the time. So um, the pandemic, one of the things that it did is it brought to light a lot of um, mental health issues, um, especially uh, regarding depression, anxiety, uh, these sorts of things that are very common in, 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 our, uh, in, in the world as a whole, but especially within the education, wor education world. Teachers and students often um, suffer from, from, from anxiety. And in, in this article that uh, I'm sharing some quotes with you from an article from, from Edutopia, um, these students um, are advocating for uh, mental health days. And they've been advocating it from before the pandemic, but then the, the pandemic just made it all the more urgent. And um, I, I'll, I'll summarize it with the quote from, from the young uh, woman on the left who, when graduating from high school, uh, she was asked to uh, fill in a survey um, that asked, asked the, the students all sorts of things like, do you feel safe and do you feel happy? And the way that she expresses it is, well, I mean, thank you for asking, but it would have been really great if you had asked me this years ago. Like, why are you waiting until I'm leaving to ask me? Um, I suppose the idea um, for that sort of exit type survey is that they'll um, um, make changes for students coming up, but it's entirely possible that it's just a, a protocol type thing and at the very least, in the case of this student, this student felt that no one really cared, not until it was too late. So, so empathy is important, not only when we're thinking about teaching and learning objectives, but when we think of our students in the holistic sense of them being human beings, just like you and I, that need support and they need um, an empathetic um, approach. And in that sense, um, and needing support, I, I, I call this the three S's, scaffolding, structure, and support. Because no one is born with skills, um, no one is born being organized or being creative or being this, that, or the other. Um, there might be what people call natural inclinations, natural talents, whatever, that's debatable, but all students, all people, work best when we are allowed to take things step by step, when we have someone guiding us through these steps, guiding us through this process, offering us a helping hand, and when we are given clear guidelines, expectations, and desired outcomes. So scaffolding, structure, and support, the three S's, absolutely essential in a creative process and in a creative endeavor. When we give our students this task of, of creating something, we have to make sure that first, we have allowed them to develop their own sense of creative worth um, gradually. It's not going to happen from one day to the next. Second, that once they are involved in the creative process, that they feel that there is structure, that they're not just sort of hanging um, freely in the air without any sort of direction. And third, that they will receive the support that they need when they feel stuck, when they feel um, like they, they can't go on or, or they haven't mastered a tool well enough or um, whatever the situation might be. And so to that end, um, some of the suggestions that I would make is um, never follow a script, like always be genuine. So when you're asking someone to be creative, if, 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 if you're following the script, it's not going to inspire confidence. They're going to feel that it's just like a one size fits all type of approach and it's not directed towards them. And that's going to be very, um, it'll demotivate them. Second, depending on different age levels, uh, students might not even know what their interests are. So we've been talking a lot about focusing on what our students' interests are and, um, and being able to help direct them towards their passions and their interests, help them develop their passions and their interests. Well, the truth is that when we are young, we often do not know what those passions and interests are. 
And going back to the scaffolding, um, sometimes we actually need help um, to step-by-step step sort of realize um, what are the things that we are interested in? What are the things that we care about? Um, that's a, a huge thing that teachers can, can do and provide for their students. And in that sense, it's also really useful to show them your passions and your interests. When they see that you are passionate and interested about something um, and that you apply your creativity to it, when you model that, when you open yourself up in that way, they will be much more inclined to follow. Um, also, it's, it's really important to create a space where they feel safe, right? Because no one likes to contribute ideas if, if they feel that they're going to be mocked or ridiculed. Um, so um, having a respectful environment, a safe environment um, with the proper structure um, where ideas can be exchanged appropriately is super important. Also, um, engaging with them um, in, on, a, on a personal level to the degree that it's appropriate and allowing them to have space in, in the class itself outside of the lesson plan is really important. It, it's, I'm sure you, you, you've all experienced um, why that's important, being able to bond with your students outside of just the role of teacher and, and student, um, but on just a, on a human personal level, super important. Um, expect them to respect each other, model that respect, and um, super important, entrust them with responsibility. If we treat children like children, they're going to act like children. And that's where we get frustrated. Well, why aren't you more responsible? You're acting like a little child. Why aren't you more organized? You're acting like a little child. Um, well, then give them responsibility. Um, put them in situations where they have to step up. They probably will. Most of the time they will. When you believe in them, when you transmit your belief in them, it's the same as with us. When, when we feel encouraged and when we feel that someone believes in us, we usually step up. It's the same with our students. And then of course, um, in terms of the scaffolding again, and the structure, uh, models, examples, warm-ups, give them something they can copy from it first, and then they can move into the terrain of looking for something original. And all of that will create a significant um, sense of empowerment. Once all of that has been um, uh, put in place, they will slowly feel genuinely committed to something. And it's almost like they're on automatic pilot. We don't have to be, we don't have to adopt coercive measures. Um, we don't have to threaten. Uh, we don't have to give them prizes. Um, the issue of grades even becomes sort of um, gray in the sense that you start to see them interested in something that's beyond what the grade they're going to receive. Um, so once they are empowered, we can sort of just step back and let them start developing um, their own um, sense of, of worth um, and, and start sort of believing in themselves, believing in their ideas and becoming independent. And in, in, uh, on that note, I'd like to share this um, quick video. Uh, it's a brilliant little animation from John Spencer, um, sort of um, visual, visually explaining all of this. We often talk about what it means to move from compliance to engagement. It's the idea of creating an environment where students want to learn rather than have to learn. But if we want students to be creative, self-directed learners, we need to move beyond student engagement and into empowerment. But this requires some paradigm shifts. That's right, we are going to be talking shift. Here's what I mean. The empowered classroom is a shift from giving choices to inspiring possibilities. It's a shift from making the subject interesting into tapping into the student interest. When you go from saying, you must learn this, to asking, what do you want to learn? It's a shift from taking assessments to assessing your own learning. An iterative process full of mistakes that ultimately lead to success. It's a shift from the teacher asking all the questions to the students asking their own questions, where they chase the inquiry process and take learning off-road. 
It's a shift from uncritical consuming to critical consuming and creating. Here students move from critical consuming to inspiration to creativity, where they use the design process to launch their work to the world. It's a shift from differentiating instruction to personalizing learning. And it's a shift from rigid to adjustable systems so that students own the process. They can set their own pace, choose their own formats, and decide what resources they want to use to accomplish their goals. It's a shift in mindset from compliance to self-direction. In other words, it's a shift towards student ownership. And when that happens, our students become the creative critical thinkers who change the world. And the truth is that our students can change the world. And we really need to believe that. And I, I insist on stressing that to, to really believe that, we need to believe that we can change the world. We need to believe that people can change things in general. Um, another um, 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 interesting author that you, you might want to look into is uh, Debbie Zakarian, who, who wrote a book um, together with uh, a colleague of hers re regarding empowerment. And she highlights, or they highlight, um, what this empowerment, how, how you can reach this level of empowerment and, um, and why it's, it's sort of uh, significant. And one of the things um, that, she, that she mentions specifically, and I think is, is a really interesting angle on it, is that in an increasingly complex world, People need to have the ability and the skills necessary to not only create solutions, to, but also be able to negotiate those solutions. So when a problem comes up, you have to be able to sit down at the table with the other people that are designing a solution to a problem, and you have to be able to negotiate your ideas versus the value of their ideas. So lots of very interesting um, um, uh, thoughts and uh, tips um, from in, in this book. So it's, it's definitely uh, worth um, checking out. And so when, we, when we're thinking about empowerment and, um, and it's sort of building on what John Spencer outlines in that, in that uh, really cool little uh, visual video, um, empowerment is the word is or rather the outcome that we should be looking for much more than engagement um, engagement became um, sort of the, the 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 word or the objective that that we've been um, hearing a lot about recently and even in this even in the summit but really what we're what we think about it what we're really striving for is empowerment student agency um, young people being able to take ownership over their actions, their decisions, their choices, their work, um, being responsible for them, and therefore being genuinely committed to what they are doing. There is nothing better, um, nothing more rewarding than to see your students working hard at something, to produce something that they came up with without any sort of concern for time or for grades but rather only because they are genuinely, sincerely committed to the outcome. Um, so if, if it, it would be great if you could just sort of um, create this little spark um, um, activity, this little visual, and uh, share with uh, the, the world uh, on Twitter. Um, it's fairly easy to use. Uh, many of you are already familiar with Spark. If not, it's pretty self-intuitive. Um, so please um, take a couple of minutes to um, do this activity. Go ahead and tweet it out, tagging me and using the Adobe EDU creative hashtag. It, it'll be fun to do and it'll be great to see um, what um, everyone shares. So if I had to summarize um, how to design for empowerment, these are the five tips that I would suggest. And I'd like to stress the first one, which is to build trust and self-confidence in your students. But I insist, it's also really important to develop 
a sense of creative self-confidence in yourself. We need to feel that we are creative. Rather, let me rephrase, we need to understand that we are creative. Once we really believe that and we transmit that self-confidence, they will be much more ready to um, take, take the chance uh, and, and, and be vulnerable by expressing their own sense of creativity. Because if we think about it, um, it's the same for anyone at any age. A lot of times what keeps us from pursuing a creative endeavor by proposing an idea or actually setting out on a, on a, on a project, on a personal project that we're, that we're really interested in is the fear that we're going to fail, um, the fear of what other people might say or how other people might judge it. So we need to get past those fears. We need to be self-confident in our own sense of creative worth. And we need to transmit that to our students so that they can um, pick up on that, um, feed off of that, and um, build on their own empowerment with our self-confidence and our empowerment. The second thing I'd suggest um, is that it's really important um, before you set out on a creative endeavor to make sure that you've genuinely um, explored their interests, their concerns, and how their, their interests and their concerns are linked to the world outside of the classroom. Um, again, it's really important to sort of get them into the mindset that they can change the world. Um, and therefore, it's, it's, it's really valuable to have them work on um, real world problems. Like, and, and that could be something that is a problem in their school or in their community, in their city, whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's really important to get them um, in that mindset as young as possible. Remember, this isn't exclusive to the older kids. This can be done from a very early age. You can have first graders, um, for instance, um, designing maps um, for, uh, for new students, right? Like a map to the school so that the new student knows where he or she needs to go for whatever, um, you know, where, where the playground is, where the bathrooms are, um, that sort of thing. Um, of course, um, different um, scaffolding when we talk about the three s's scaffolding structure and support it's going to look different at different age levels but ultimately it's it's the same process and it's the same outcomes third um, when you set out to design your curriculum and your lesson plans and your activities design them based on those interests and those problems and those concerns that they've already expressed um, a passion for a curiosity for Fourth, um, guide um, the evaluation um, of, their, of their solutions. So when we, when we mentioned earlier the, that the creative process requires critical judgments on what you are creating, that needs to be scaffolded. They need to be supported in that. Um, they're, they're not going to know um, um, just uh, by themselves how to gauge the value of one idea or another or of a particular um, um, deliverable throughout the creative process. They're going to need help in establishing whether or not they're on the right track, whether or not um, the, the idea or that specific moment of the process has value and is viable. Um, and then finally, again, the three S's, provide the necessary structure, resources, um, and resources for the development of their creative endeavor. Um, for whatever it is that they're going to produce, they're going to need scaffolding, structure, support, and resources. So um, I'll, I'll, I'd like to just quickly share some examples with you from my, from my own classroom. Um, so, uh, so recently with, with my uh, grade um, 10 students, um, they, um, they were given the challenge of coming up with something that would solve a problem they cared about, right? So uh, obviously with the pandemic, they, they're not able to go to live performances. Um, many of the live performances that they were interested in were canceled. Um, and so they came up with a solution. They came up with um, trying to convince Spotify. They, were, they, they worked on a pitch to Spotify to include live streaming 
of performances on their um, on their platform. And so I'm just going to quickly just share what the classroom looked like as they were working. No oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so we can give her a session, then concerts, yeah. and then we'll see what we're gonna do with it. So my okay. um, my recommendation is okay. So as of right now, the lights are concerts, right? I think so. Yeah. So obviously, just take that out. Make this all live. Yeah. This is also live. And then um, you should do two categories here. Um, and what you should do is to make it like not look weird when a uh, concert's not happening. So mm -hmm. one one of the is gonna be concerts happening right now. The other one is upcoming concerts. Yeah. And then when the concerts aren't happening right now, you just take that out, and it's just gonna be upcoming concerts. Okay. Right. So it, that kind of simplifies it for the user. I mean, what do you guys think? Wait, what you want to say, like, concerts that are happening? Yeah, he wants to do lives in here, and then one Yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah, 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 we can, like, basically, uh, so Then what's to, the point to, of getting to, to scroll down? To simplify yeah. It just made so that you have a heat box, like, when you're gonna first turn the call, it's gonna have to be. Oh, okay. But now they are overlapping, so the program is going on. What is overlapping? Right here, in the bottom. But, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, on your phone, we're gonna keep it, uh, we're gonna keep it here, then. So we're gonna keep it in this place, not in that one. Uh, no, because the, your library is gonna be like, I think it's gonna be here, like next to search. Let's say. And then another uh, project that I worked on um, in that school was um, using um, um, augmented reality with some first graders in creating a geometry garden. Um, they did some fantastic things there as well, and also. Um, we we recently I recently um, taught a, um, a a group of uh, high school students from Romania um, who came to visit in Spain um, and to and to um, take a course um, and I wanted to sh I want to share this video because it's remarkable how this student. Uh, managed to combine, or this team rather, because it's two people, were able to combine three different um, applications um, to be able to express their idea for something that they called Meow Bank, um, which is uh, an app that provides the service of being able to convert a cryptocurrency into any other currency. Um, it, just keep in mind that these students had never used XD before, and that's what they used to produce the uh, the the wireframe and like the images that you'll see for the app. And in fact, right now in this still, you can see the little the little cat who's like scrolling through the through the application. And, and that little window in that phone was created with XD. Um, everything else was sort of the animation was created with with um, Photoshop, and then the final edit uh, the final video was edited with Premiere. Again, thank you to uh, Claire and everyone at the Adobe team for providing these licenses. That will be 10 Dogecoin. Woof! I don't have Dogecoins. I only have yours. You must pay with Dogecoins. Woof! Hey, have you ever heard of the new Melbank? It converts a currency into any other, including cryptocurrencies. Oh, really? What do I have to do? Well, you download the app and uh, create an account using your data, then enter your password. Oh, and you can also add me as your friend and we can like chat and transfer money from one to another at any time. Also, the card arrives in seconds. Melbank, make your life easier. So lots of um, imagination, creativity, and work, obviously, in in that um, in that process. And I'd like to sort of end by reflecting and just sharing with you um, what happens, what can happen, or what has happened to me at least when I've when I've connected on a on a creative level with, with my students. Um, I've been very fortunate to actually 
have relationships with students that end up being collaborations. So after they, they're in my class, um, we were able to establish a creative connection that led to their own development in, in their lives later on, um, but that also sort of came back full circle and allowed us to be collaborators. So on, um, on the left, um, you'll see um, a painting um, by one of my former students, uh, Michelle Siton, um, who ended up being, or rather, she, she's a painter, she's, she's a fabulous painter, and it was just a remarkable um, um, process. Um, after she had graduated from school, she was my student in the seventh grade, we um, worked together on designing the, the, the cover um, for one of my one of my band's albums, it was it was a phenomenal collaboration and something that wouldn't have happened had we not had that previous experience in the classroom where we could sort of um, already work together on creative um, endeavors and creative activities. Another um, student of mine, um, Manu Becker, um, I when when he was my student, he expressed interest in music and being able to write music and produce music. And so in class, uh, I gave him some extra time and some extra personalized coaching on how to do that with GarageBand and some other tools. And next thing I know, he became a brilliant um, singer songwriter. Um, and again, also um, he, he ended up, it, it, was, it was a very moving moment when he had his first live performance, he invited me to it um, and he thanked me for having um, uh, given him that time and uh, those, that, those initial lessons in, in how to use a garage band to make his own music. And then we, we established a, a creative relationship. He ended up singing with, uh, with my band um, and it was, it, it was just another one of those incredible um, creative experiences with, 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 with a former student. And then, um, and last but not least, uh, Jacqueline Kalach, um, who was a student of mine in, in middle school. And she and some friends had um, worked, they, they made this project for the science fair um, when, they were, when they were in the seventh or eighth grade. And it was, it, it, the, the, the project was this hand-drawn comic book um, that was talking about the risks behind um, using psychiatric medications like Ritalin on young children. Um, it was phenomenally researched. It was fantastically drawn. Um, it, was, it, was, it was remarkable in every way, shape, or form. It was everything that you would want um, a student to be able to produce um, on their own. Um, they were, they were genuinely committed to it, it was fantastic. Unfortunately, um, the school uh, didn't like the idea that they were challenging um, the use of these medications, and so they did not let them present their work in the science fair. Fast forward a few years, um, they were still interested in, in, in investigating and in researching this and doing something about it, um, and again, we started working together. I, I had another opportunity to work on a creative level with these students. And throughout this process with, uh, with Jacqueline specifically, I remember at some point telling her um, that she should maybe consider studying education at, you know, at university. And she was like, no, I'll probably just stick to engineering. It's what my parents want, et cetera. Anyway, um, long story short, she ended up um, being a committed educator. She worked very hard in finding the, making the right connections and finding the right people. And she actually ended up um, founding her own um, school in Mexico City. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, in fact, I could perhaps share some of that with you. You'll see, um, it's called Nia School. And um, everything about it is about the student. It's all student-centered. And the, the architect that, that um, they hired for this project had a very interesting approach. 
Um, he believed that using primary colors, which is very common in most um, elementary schools and, and kindergartens, infantilizes uh, children unnecessarily. Um, so he used this very, very um, serene sort of color palette of natural colors. Um, you can see the designs are made for exploration and for play. And um, it's just remarkable to see how uh, a student who um, I was able to work with creatively and make some important, well, make some suggestions, ended up um, really going all the way in terms of empowerment um, and, and in terms of really believing that she can change the world and really going um, this far in, in doing it. So I'd like to sort of um, uh, end with this um, idea of, of creating projects that are personal, original, and viable, not only for, not only in terms of, of um, our students, but also in terms of ourselves. It's really important um, that um, we believe in ourselves, that we strive for that middle point. This middle point here is, of course, not something that happens from one day to the next. It's something that we might even be pursuing our entire lives. Um, it's something, it's an ideal that we strive for. It's aspirational. So we shouldn't feel pressured to make our children um, reach, our students rather, reach this point immediately. But rather what we can do with the time that we have with them is to make them comfortable enough to and interested enough and believe in themselves enough to want to try to get to that point and just constantly remind them to, to work on producing things that they are personally interested in, that have originality and that are viable. And so it will be, it will be wonderful if um, you can go ahead and tweet um, what your sense of creative worth is by completing the sentence, I am creative because I, and then it's up to you, um, why do you feel that you're creative? Go ahead and uh, tweet that out to uh, tag me before code um, and um, using the, the Adobe Education hashtag, Adobe EDU Creative. It would be wonderful to see that um, on Twitter. And please do um, stay in touch. Um, I'd, I'd love to uh, stay in touch through Twitter. So um, um, go ahead and you, you can find me there. And um, it'll, be, it'll be great to continue sharing experiences, um, things that we learn, um, thoughts, reflections, um, uh, student work, and, and all these wonderful, fantastic things um, that we're all doing with our students. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining the Adobe Education Summit. Um, and we look forward to um, keeping in touch with you and seeing you next year. Bye for now.